The Lord be with you. Welcome. Welcome to worship. My name is Martin Tell. I have such a privilege to be able to uh, be director of music of this place. I know many of you, many of you uh, are familiar faces to me. I'm so glad that we can be back together again. We're going to begin with singing, and I've got a few words to say about how we're going to start. Uh, you'll see we're starting with a song called, And Are We Yet Alive? Any Wesleyans in the house? All right. Uh, John Wesley took this song of his brother Charles, and he began using it to open conferences. In the 18th century, uh, when you came to a conference after a year, you were anxious to see who would be returning. Centuries ago, the concept of life expectancy was quite different. And so you made no assumptions of who would be there this year. And now we gather after a pandemic and our idea of life expectancy is so different than last time we had gathered. So I think we can, in a way, sense what they sensed in that 18th century of expectancy and anxiety even of who will be there, whose faces will we see. And we appreciate the miracle of seeing each other's faces. Even with masks on, uh, we see each other's faces. Our eyes gaze into each other's. Uh, tomorrow we will remember those who have passed on and are now with God. But today we give glory and thanks to Jesus that we are here and that we see one another. The other thing I will say about our opening songs um, is it's going to take the form of sort of a Moravian singstunda. And that is, uh, the Moravian tradition often would take just a few stanzas of all these different hymns and put them together and create and expand upon certain themes. Uh, and they could do this because they had hundreds and hundreds of memorized stanzas in their collective repertoire. Uh, we can't assume that, so we've given you the words uh, we've also, all the hymns that we're going to sing today are out of one hymnal. That's the red hymnal in front of you. So if you would like to look at the music notes, uh, you can find that. All the hymn numbers are in your bulletins. Um, but we're going to develop this theme by singing together, just some selected uh, stanzas. We start with um, Charles Wesley and Are We Yet Alive? And we stay with Wesley just a little bit longer and sing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. We gather in love. Um, and then we invoke the Holy Spirit already with that closing stanza of Wesley. And then we go into breathe on me, breath of God. And it's interesting, we sing this song of the Spirit as breath. And the next song we sing started as a melody, a melody from Singapore, um, to which words were added as the rainbow after rain, as hope that's born again, as the wind song through the trees. All this metaphor of the Holy Spirit no longer is breath, but in a slightly different way, the Holy Spirit as wind. And then we move into this dyad of hymns, Here on Jesus Christ I Will Stand, a song from Kenya. But it's these, one, one of these wonderful turnaround songs. It's a song that originated here as My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, brought over to Africa. The Africans made it their own, put it in their own tempo, in their own rhythm. Um, and then somebody said, let's translate it from Swahili into English. Well, then you get this fresh new song, which is a riff on what we know as My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. And we will end with a couple of stanzas of My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. We let's remain seated to, um, to sing this singstunda. We'll finally stand when we get to those last couple songs. Um, I'm going to ask the choir to stand because they're working today. So the choir. <laughs> And they will help to lead us. And are we yet alive?
Amen. Thank you, choir, and thank you, Martin. He's exquisite. Welcome. Welcome to reunion, and most importantly, welcome back to Princeton Seminary. Whether you are joining us online or here in our beloved chapel, we are deeply grateful that you're here. We recognize that it can take a lot of coordination to get back to Princeton. And we also recognize that it takes a lot of courage to come back here as we continue to navigate a global pandemic. So I want you to know that we see you. I want you to know that we see you in these pews, in this sacred space. We see you online on your computers and we see all the ways you are serving Jesus Christ and ministries marked by faith, integrity, scholarship, compassion, competence, and joy. Friends, the good news, at least in part, is that Jesus says, come, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. Friends, may these next three days be restful and rejuvenating. May you experience the love of God that dwells within and among us. And may you experience this reunion as Princeton Seminary's love letter to each and every one of you. We are so glad that you're here. Welcome in every possible sense. Beloved, it's my great privilege and pleasure to welcome you to the Seminary Chapel today. Uh, we are glad you're here. My name is Jan Ammon, and I have the privilege of serving this community as Minister of the Chapel, and for this semester as Interim Dean of Students. And I welcome you, along with my wonderful colleague Martin Tell, who you've heard from, who's being assisted today by Jess and Mina, and a fabulous choir, which is made up of current students, students who will be graduating on Saturday, and alumni. So thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Um, since we've last gathered in person for reunion three years ago, we've all gone through a lot. Here, we've gone through a chapel flood and a complete restoration. We've gone through a pandemic year plus online worship. And we've gone through the renaming of our building. The, we are so grateful that this sacred space continues to be a place where calls are heard and decisions are made and sorrows are mourned and joys are shared and world events are processed. It continues to be a place where the word is preached, prayers are lifted, and songs are sung. So welcome back. We are so glad you're here. And we also are so glad for our other worship leaders today, Genesis and Karen, and President Barnes is preaching today. We still worship here Monday through Friday and uh, during the academic year, and we're always delighted when President Barnes still preaches for, uh, for us every week. So, beloved, again, welcome, and let us continue our worship of God. Thank you. 
came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me also add my word of welcome to you all. Welcome home. We've missed you while you've been gone. Your room is ready. <laughs> it's good to have you back. Let us pray. By the power of your Holy Spirit, O oh God, Allow us to find ourselves in this sacred narrative that it may be your word for us as well. One that transforms us closer into the image of the word made flesh. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Seems that almost every time you pick up a newspaper these days, you are reading either about politicians who are invoking religion or religious leaders who are invoking politics. The politicians are on a crusade to get elected, and that's why they invoke religion to address our fears. And the religious leaders are on a crusade to either split their denominations or to hold them together, depending on which side of the political factions that they are on. Now, I'm not too worried about us religious folks being political with each other. We've been at it a long, long time. <laughs> Goes back to the Council of Jerusalem. I, but this crusading thing, I, I think that worries even Jesus. Historically, crusades have never worked out for political leaders or for the church, and certainly not for the reign of Christ. Before we get to this text that was just so beautifully read for us, Jesus has told his disciples that he is now heading to Jerusalem. 
And some of the disciples, especially we know James and John, thought this meant that Jesus was launching now finally his own crusade to take power in Jerusalem. And they were excited about the possibilities of this. Imagine our guy in office. <laughs> and sensing this, Jesus looks at James and John and asks them, what do you want me to do for you? Wow, what a question. Can you imagine what it would take to, to hear Jesus? How, you, how would you respond if Jesus was so, so clear and to the point maybe even while you're here, away from your busyness at reunion, to hear Jesus ask you the question, what do you want me to do for you? Would you tell him about your crusade to make a difference with your life? Would you tell him about the crusade you had to get people back into church? or about the crusade for justice, or for community, or just to find someone to take away the loneliness. What do you want me to do for you? James and John, responded by asking Jesus if when he comes into his glory could they sit on his left and right hand and Jesus responds to their response by essentially saying bad answer <laughs> you still have not seen who I really am Well, as they make their way towards Jerusalem, <clears throat> Jesus and the disciples pass through Jericho to get there. And in Jericho, we are told that a large crowd began to follow Jesus because they too were excited about this new crusade and they wanted to get on board. They were joining the parade because they too had things that Jesus could do for them. And frankly, I think this is where you and I have to find ourselves in the text. We're a part of the large crowd who have goals, yearnings, dreams, and we need some help from Jesus and making the dreams come true. But Jesus <clears throat> is very clear that he has his own mission. And that mission is not a crusade to succeed whatever the cost. No, the reason he's going to Jerusalem is because he's dying to give us mercy. Mercy for all the damage we have done on our crusades to get what we want. There is nothing more dangerous than a religious person on a crusade. <clears throat> To crusade means that we have provided holy legitimation for what we want. We have decided that this is what God wants, and so God is the one who has commissioned us with a goal, that we just have the goal, and if there's going to be salvation here, it's up to us to do it. We then become messianic. 
but we soon meet up with opposition and challenge and obstacles. So we redouble on our efforts, deciding we will do whatever it takes to fulfill the goal. And so that means that we become mean. Mean and messianic. And the world does not need more mean messiahs from the church. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that we don't engage in mission. Of course we do. We are constantly calling our students, as we called you, to engage in the mission of Christ, to be a formative force for the light of Christ as witnesses, to be activists for the causes of justice. Yes, of course we do that. But there's a big difference in following Christ the Savior and then taking on the role of being the Savior. What I'm saying is that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's our hope. When I was a student here, well over 40 years ago, I took a class with Dr. Bruce Metzger on Revelation. And we were getting near the end of class and he was lecturing on the triumph of Jesus Christ. And he did something very uncharacteristic. He looked up from his notes, <laughs> took off his wire rimmed glasses, set them down, and said, future leaders of the church and the academy, I hope that when you begin your work, you will start each morning by getting on your knees and thanking God that you are not necessary. <laughs> now, I wrote all this down in the margins. <laughs> I like might be on the test. I, didn't. <laughs> I don't remember a lot of that lecture, but I remember that margin note. It stayed with me through my ministry, especially those early years, because I kind of kept arguing with Dr. Metzger. <laughs> really? We're not necessary? Really? Oh, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. It's a, Surely we're needed. That's why I got into this business. I went on as kind of a back of the brain conversation with myself until my five year reunion here. And I came back to campus for the first time and I actually had the blessing of seeing Dr. Metzger walk across the quad and I thought, this is my moment. <laughs> I ran up to him. And I said, Dr. Metzger, you know, in class one time, you, had, you just gave this aside. You said that we should be thanking God that we're not necessary. I've been thinking a lot about that. And I was just wondering if, I don't know, maybe you wanted to take it back. <laughs> <laughs> he got that kind of look that he would often get, and he said, no, no, Craig, <laughs> you're not necessary. <laughs> it was almost as if to say, especially you, Craig. <laughs> but then he went on to give the next sentence, which I so wished he had done five years ago. <laughs> he said, you're too important to be necessary. You are beloved by the mercy of God. Why would you want to be necessary when you can be loved? Ah. <laughs> As Jesus and the disciples and now the crusading crowd were making their way out of Jericho on their way to Jerusalem, they passed by 
a blind beggar named Bartimaeus who cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now the, the people around the beggar told him, shut up. Don't stop Jesus now. We're finally getting somewhere. <laughs> this is kind of my paraphrase. It's not exactly <laughs> what it is. But it just made the beggar yell all the more louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It's striking that this is the first time in the gospel according to Mark that anyone refers to Jesus as the son of David. It's the 10th chapter. The first time anyone refers to Jesus as the son of David, the Messiah, the Savior who can save us even from ourselves. And isn't it ironic that the people with sight could not see that because they were blinded by their ambition? And the blind man is the only one who could see clearly just who Jesus is. The next line may be one of the most important in the story. We're told that then Jesus stood still. Hmm. Jesus, the God with us, stops the parade, brings a, a halt to all of the crusading crowd around him to attend to this one person who finally understands the difference in asking for help and in calling out for mercy. To ask for help, to ask for mercy, these are not nearly the same thing. We ask for help when we're looking for a little boost in reaching our own goals. But to cry out for mercy is to cast yourself, your community, our world into the loving hands of a savior. When my daughter was a little girl, we were living in Washington, D.C. at the time, and I was once walking with her past the Supreme Court. And we stopped there, and as I held her little hand, I pointed to the Supreme Court, and I said, sweetheart, someday this is where you're going to work. <laughs> and in the years that followed, while she was still a little girl, I kept praying for help in achieving my goals for her life. Then she became a teenager, <laughs> and I stopped praying for help, and I started praying for mercy. <laughs> you see the difference? I could also use this same application to the three churches that I served as a pastor. In all three of those churches, after I arrived, while I was unpacking my dreams for this congregation, I prayed for help in achieving them. And somewhere around the third year, I stopped praying for help and prayed for mercy. And only then, did the dreams of God begin to unfold upon the congregation and me. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. 
You know, it's so significant that Bartimaeus didn't just ask Jesus for a few coins. That's what we would expect of a beggar who probably thought Jesus the rabbi would be an easy mark. But that would have meant that Bartimaeus had just settled in to the identity of being a beggar and that all he wanted was a little boost at being a more successful beggar. But he knew that he needed far more than that. So he is named in this text, which means he can't be just remembered as the beggar. We can't reduce his identity to that, not anymore. He is Bartimaeus, who will forever be remembered as the one who knew, who could see the need to cry out for mercy if he was ever going to be fully alive. And in response to that cry for mercy, standing still, facing him, this is so wonderful. And the disciples all around him in the crowd, James and John right here, Jesus now looks at Bartimaeus and he asks, what do you want me to do for you? Isn't that fantastic? (laughs) The exact same question that he had asked James and John. What do you want me to do for you? And you know, I got to think that this was as much a mercy for James and John as it was for Bartimaeus. Maybe this time they got it. Maybe now they understood that Bartimaeus crying out for mercy could see something about Jesus they could not. And maybe that's why Mark wrote the gospel just the way he did. So that we too would have to confront the question, the exact same question that won't go away. And we too now have a chance to see that the most profoundly important prayer is the one asking for mercy. You start calling for that, you can make Jesus stand still in his tracks. What do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus said, my teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said, go. Your faith has made you well. Faith, it's a way of seeing. Seeing that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen. Friends, let us go to God in prayer together, knowing that we pray to a God who hears us, sees us, and loves us. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this time of reunion for Princeton Seminary. We are humbled that you would work with us and through us to continue to tell your love story to all people. Help us to be vulnerable before you, trusting you with our hopes and sufferings like Bartimaeus. May we cry out with reckless abandonment, knowing that you will always stop, turn towards us, and listen. 
O Holy One, we ask for your blessing upon your church universal, for the leaders who make decisions. We pray for our siblings from all spiritual communities working for love's highest good. Creator God, we pray for those who are working to protect and care for the land and animals and the water that you have gifted us with. We pray for your beautiful creation, especially those places that are hurting and broken. We lift up those areas that are war-torn around the world. Oh God, especially in Ukraine, in the Middle East. We pray for all nations living with food insecurity, all in the wake of natural disaster, and wherever people are displaced and forced to leave their homes to save their lives. We pray for all who are seeking to cross borders over all the world for asylum. May we, the rest of us, be places of refuge, sanctuary, and hope. And show us how to be your peacemakers, how to advocate, how to pray. We continue, O oh God, to lift up the people of Buffalo, New York, who are grieving and reeling from the horrible violence inflicted due to racism. Help us to be honest before you and within ourselves to reveal the ways we participate in upholding structural racism. Fill us with your spirit of truth and justice that we may be a force to dismantle it. We pray for all those who are suffering today in body, mind, and spirit, those in the last few days of their earth earthly journey, for all the caretakers and all those grieving losses of any kind. We pray for them to feel surrounded by your comfort and healing. Help them to know, God, that you see them. We pray for our communities and churches, and especially this day, we pray for the present and future of Princeton Seminary. Guide us and move us closer to your vision. And now, church, what else should we pray? In silence, let us offer those prayers to God. It's in your holy name that we pray these things. And now let us join together praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
John and I are thrilled to welcome all of you to Springdale, beginning at 4.15. I have been asked to invite you to come uh, through the front doors. Just look for the blue doors off Mercer Street. We'll be standing on the porch ready to greet you in a few minutes. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We pass the peace of Christ to those around you.